Okay, thank you very much, Mike, for the opportunity. And thanks to Lou Moir, Moyer, who is the person who decided to bug me about, he saw in my bio that I had served on the Coral Sea and we'd been involved in the Mayaguez as a rescue ship. And he said, we need to do something. So Lou is the person that got us going. I wanna start out with this time from the end of May, 1975, and it shows Ford drawing the line, he and Henry Kissinger, and it was a big victory for Ford and Kissinger, but at what cost, and we're gonna get into that. This is the memorial service on uh, May 16th on Coral Sea with the Marines who had recovered. And one thing, as we all know, we all saw things through a straw from our own unit. I was a skinny Lieutenant JG. I was one of eight officer of the decks qualified to run the ship for the captain on four hour watch the uh, bridge team. So what I saw was from a position of a surface warfare officer. I wanna turn it over to Colonel Lou Moyer because he was at a higher position. <laughs> higher, higher, is this thing working? No. no. Talk louder. <laughs> there you go. Is it working now? No. 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 Uh, the green light's on, Mike. Okay. Is it working now? I don't hear anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you? Yeah. yeah, we're picking you up on the camera. So yeah. Okay. Talk loud. Talk loud. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was out at Fifth Air Force. I'm not altogether sure why. Uh, because I came out of SAC headquarters. Uh, but if you happen to read my bio, you would have seen that in my early days, I started off in F-86s. And that, plus my clearance level, sent me off to uh, Fifth Air Force, where I, I became the uh, uh, division chief for support operations. And support operations meant that we were responsible for everything in the Fifth Air Force area except for the F-4s, which made us the cats and dogs organization. So when we get into this briefing, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about the decision side and, and how those decisions were probably not the best in the world uh, and how they continued to, and hopefully it's now been fixed. So with that, I'll turn it back to Don. Thanks, Lou. And as Lou said, we're going to talk about politics. We're going to talk about the military, special ops, and decision making. If you have any questions at any time, please pipe up. I want to rewind back to 1972. There was an Easter offensive. Twelve North Vietnamese Army divisions came across in all these different areas. You can see how bad it was. That's a 19-year-old uh, Cobra gunship pilot reloading in the Central Highlands. His name's Bob Hasselbein. And he ended up becoming an A-10 pilot in the Air Force and uh, a Delta pilot. So he was there, 3rd Brigade, 1st Cavalry Division was one of the main units still there. 196 Infantry was also there. They were down to one F-4 squadron, so they, Nixon and Kissinger surged four F-4 squadrons, 20 B-52s, three cruisers and destroyers, and there are actually a lot more than that. Uh, we went from 84 up to 138 ships in the Pacific seven aircraft carriers. There were only 14 in the U.S. Navy. They surged everything they had. Now, what's the magic date? It's 1972. It's the election year. We have 124,000 troops in January, and we're going to be down to 20,000 in December, and we are getting out of Vietnam, and the North Vietnamese know it. We lost all this, and then uh, that was the original linebacker, a lot of people don't know, besides B-52s and F-4s, there was all this Navy activity. This is what I consider the best ship in the Navy, the Newport News, Teak Decks, light cruiser, uh, lesser ship. This is my ship with a misfire. This is because the captain was trying to set a record shooting 33,000 rounds in eight months. Now, I'm going to say some bad things about Henry Kissinger, so if anybody's related to him, put up your hand. I don't want to upset him. <laughs> he came to work for Richard Nixon in 1969. He was the National Security Advisor. In 1971-72, he and Nixon were trying to make peace with both Red China and Russia. And in his preliminary things with the number two man 
in China, who is Zhou Enlai, the premier. He's over there schmoozing with him and talking about how we're going to get out of Vietnam next year. And we need a decent interval. If South Vietnam is overrun after we withdraw, we will not intervene. So Zhou Enlai says, what's a decent interval? And Henry Kissinger, the son of a bitch, said 18 months. We ended up helping the Vietnamese for about 26 months before they fell. And I'm going to get into this. So I don't want to have a heart attack here, but that guy pisses me off. <laughs> and he eventually, you know, uh, this is him with Lee Duc Toe and the Paris Peace Agreement, January 27th. If you go on the internet, you'll see this. Many people feel as I do. He does not need a Nobel Peace Prize. This is what happened. There was the peace accords on the 27th. And already the North Vietnamese army and the South Vietnamese army were maneuvering. It was called the War of the Flags. And we, until the very last day, January 27th, were giving every bit of support we could. The Turner Joy, which by the way, was the ship that came to the Maddox's aid in August 64 for Tonkin Gulf, fired all 3,000 of its five inch rounds, just fired them off, you know, in in Quang Tri province. And also off the Enterprise, this is Harley Hall. He was the skipper of uh, VF-143, puking dogs. He had been a blue angel. He and his Rio were shot down. They were working with Nail-08 and OV-10. When that nail crashed, the Viet Cong just killed the observer and the pilot. He was seen in his chute. His Rio got captured, POW. And it appears that Harley Hall didn't die in the accident, but was a high value person who was in very bad shape. And there is indication that he was interrogated by the Russians. You know, he's a very high ranking guy and he never came back and all I got was some teeth back. So you can read about this. Barrett Tillman wrote about this. Later, you had the ships clearing the mines called End Sweep. And then, in between 73, 74, we had Watergate in 73, 74, Nixon resigns, and he and Kissinger, who's now the Secretary of State, are involved in this Operation Eagle Pull, which is to get our people out of Phnom Penh, the capital of uh, Cambodia. And as you can see, the Jolly Green Giants, this is the 40th Aero Rescue and Recovery Squadron, and Marine uh, CH-53s off of the Okinawa helped do that evacuation. They were uh, supported by a Kingbird EC-130. This is the ambassador getting taken over to Thailand. And on the 17th of April, the Khmer Rouge take Phnom Penh. So just put that into perspective because one month later, we're going to be talking Mayaguez. We don't talk about these people, but these are the people that made the heroic last stand. And I dug up this information. This is Li Min Dao, a Brigadier General. He coordinated the last stand at Wan Lok, which is guarding the entryway to Saigon. This man, uh, Tran Quang Khoi, was the CEO of this assault task force. He guarded Benoit. This man took off and flew multiple missions and was last seen taking off and was shot down. This man was executed. These guys stayed in camps until 1992 when McCain, Carey, and others got them released. These are heroes. John, I yeah. just to point out Swan Lock was the last area of 2nd Brigade 25th Infantry operated. Really? Yeah, I was the brigade engineer. And what year and month was that? Yep, Swan Lock. This was the largest evacuation by helicopter in history, and it was a joint effort. This is a Marine Heavy HMH, CH-53s, and then they used 46s. This is Air America, and this is the 21st Special Ops Squadron in Thailand, and they're landing Vietnamese and Americans. This is on Midway. And there were 70 total aircraft. They flew over 7,000 people out. And can you imagine they're flying 
20 at a time, 30 at a time to get to 7,000. Some of these marine pilots just went for two days without sleeping. They just kept going. And they just put the oil in, real heroes. So back in the South China Sea, there were about 50 Navy and MSC uh, ships. The Midway and Hancock had cleared their decks off, gotten rid of their air wing, clear decks, and that's where all these people came. And Okinawa, which was a marine landing pad helicopter operation. And then Enterprise and Coral Sea were the two guard ships, so I was on Coral Sea. And John Petacolis served on Enterprise. And this was an amazing time. Unfortunately, this success of this operation influenced the people back in Washington. Oh, we did it. We, my Aguas is happening. We can do it again. These are the iconic photos pushing over a South Vietnamese helicopter. This is a LST bringing people from the north to the south as the country was cut in half in March. These are the people heading to uh, Grandy Island, Subic Bay. And this is the bloody NVA coming through the gates of the government in Saigon. So this is the 29th and 30th of April. So about this time is when um, this ship is lumbering along at probably 10 knots. It's a sea land ship on contract. It's bringing stuff out of Saigon, heading over through the Gulf of Thailand to Thailand. And out comes a former Swift, um, swift boat manned by Khmer Rouge, and they go across the bow and they use their rocket launchers to uh, get it to stop. And the captain tries to maneuver, he does heroic things. Uh, they try to escape and they can't because they're going to get um, on fire, etc. And so about 30 people are in the crew. One thing was Cambodia, Khmer Rouge claimed 12 miles. We only recognized three miles, so he's probably, that master's probably going in a straight line. Not good. All right, now we get into Kissinger, the Secretary of State, the new president, Jerry Ford, who had served on an aircraft carrier in World War II, so he knew about ship capabilities. They want to show the world that we are still capable after the fall of Vietnam two weeks ago. The frequent wind evacuation was a success. Kissinger says, I'm not thinking of Cambodia, but Korea and Soviet Union and the others. We wanted to show the communist world not to mess with us. Ford and Kissinger ignored the 1973 War Powers Act, which basically limited the president and being able to commit troops for more than X hours or days without congressional authority. So they sent the forces in on the 12th through the 14th and then they told the Congress what they were doing. Now, there was a big fear of another USS Pueblo which had happened in 68 and I'll turn it over to Lou. Yeah, the uh, thing about the Pueblo uh, which happens to be a museum in North Korea if, uh, if you don't know what it is but th they made the same bad decisions as they did here, if you will. The, uh, <clears throat> the North Koreans were kind of surrounding the Pueblo. The uh, Fifth Air Force commander knew this and knew what they were doing. He put a flight of uh, four F-105s, uh, fully armed at the end of the runway, engines running, and, and SAC added a tanker so they could refuel. They where, where were they sitting on the runway? I didn't know. Kadena, in Okinawa. Kadena. They could have taken out those North Korean boats that were surrounding the Pueblo. And the decision from the hierarchy was, this is not your business, bow out. And so they shut down the aircraft and parked. Uh, and then, obviously, the North Koreans took the boat. Should I call it a boat or a ship? How long would it take to get the F-105 to get from Kadena to uh, on the sea? Mm -hmm. yeah. Not too much. 45 minutes? Yeah, yeah. Well, they could have gotten there in time. Oh, yeah, they were surrounding that boat for some period of time. But what the North Koreans and their friends got was all that sophisticated uh, uh, code uh, encoding equipment, the uh, cyber stuff. Well, theoretically, 
Generally speaking, the guy Cruz had destroyed it, but there is a question about that. Yeah. Okay. So the first NSC, National Security Council meeting, is at noon on 12 May. And if you look around here, you can see the players. There's President Ford. There's Kissinger. Of course, he's the guy that's got all the experience in the room. And he is determined to give the Khmer Rouge a bloody nose. Now, one thing I want to emphasize, with all the satellite communication, which was just coming in, Miller Hudson is a former Navy comm officer. They had some very special stuff in the White House Situation Room, which made them able to communicate, for example, to my ship, to the Combat Information Center, and literally ask about bomb load on the A7s. This, we will see, is a part of the problem. So Kissinger says the first problem is how to get the ship back. Second problem is how we appear. And what we need for the next 48 hours, we need to come on strong with a statement, a strong note, which Ambassador George Bush in Beijing took to the Red Chinese and a show of force. So he's already leading. Rockefeller, the vice president, says, I think we need a violent response. If they get hostages, this can go on forever, like Lou was talking about. And Schlesinger, right there, is the Secretary of Defense urging restraint and use of minimal force. And his deputy, Clement, says, there is a real chance this is an in-house spat. In fact, the Khmer Rouge thought that this was a spy ship. And also, the reason they had gotten on the Koh Tang Island and were guarding was they were afraid of the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, who had been in uh, conflict with them. So end result. Ford says, we'll turn around Coral Sea, get it going, and decide on a joint military operation. And this is a picture of the actual briefing by General Jones, who was the Air Force Chief of Staff under uh, the JCS chairman who was in Europe. And I'll turn it over to Lou because he knows about General Jones in the Air Force. Well, actually, coming up in May, I'm supposed to give a speech. And in that speech, I'll <coughs> talk about when a couple of nukes were dropped on the ramp. The commander of 2nd Air Force at that time was General Jones. And he flew up, and those of us on alert watched the sink sack, a vice sink sack, chew him out right in front of us, wow. all ranking guys. But wow. Last, obviously, didn't hurt his career. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. So notice this statement, awkwardness of command relationships in a joint military venture became clouded by lack of intelligence on the crew's whereabouts. And you're going to find this is the real problem. And here's the cabinet. There's Kissinger again from another angle. These are actual pictures of uh, Camp Hung San, Sihanoukville which is where they're thinking of bombing. So how did this take place? So here's our commands, uh, chain of command of all of us in the military. Admiral Noel Gaylor, four-star admiral, is sink pack. Under him for the Air Force is General Wilson, Pacific Air Force. I'm going to turn it over to Lou about the 7th and 5th. Yeah, 5th Air Force is at Yokota, Japan. They were responsible for U.S. Air Forces in Korea and Japan, which included Okinawa. <coughs> General Galligan was our boss at the time. And then uh, down at Seventh Air Force, he was in, in Thailand, and he was responsible for Air Force organizations in Thailand. Subsequently, they moved some of those in Air, uh, Seventh Air Force to the Philippines. Thanks, Lou. And then on the Navy side, Mickey Wisner, so Sink Pack Fleet, he's in charge of the entire Pacific Fleet. And notice as a combatant command, the Navy is always in charge of the Pacific, which is the biggest land or a water area. And we have most of our Navy stuff over there. And usually Pack Fleet or Pack can become the chief of naval operations. These guys are highly selected this is uh, Mickey Wisner, who's PAC Fleet, and under him is Seventh Fleet, kind of an equivalent to these guys on the Air Force side, Admiral Steele. And then on our ship, we were part of Task Force 73, which was on Coral Sea, and the destroyers around it was 
Admiral Coogan, and we call that a Commodore, the man that's in charge of the task force. And under him is the captain of our ship, who is Tom Rogers, and under him was Captain Hoagie Carmichael, the CAG, Carrier Air Group 15, and that's their emblem. He later became commanding officer of Midway. So put yourself in Admiral Gaylor's position. First of all, Admiral Gaylor is a very special person. Um, he was an ace in World War II. He shot down two and was given partial credit in the Battle of the Coral Sea, which is May 1942. And then he was involved in Midway, where he became an ace. So remember the name Coral Sea, because he's going to turn to the aircraft carrier named after that battle. So you got 14 carriers in the Navy. Four of them were directly involved in Operation Frequent Wind, plus the Okinawa, which is a landing pad helicopter, which has Marines on it. So in Port Subic Bay, he's looking down at his status board. He's got the Hancock. It's got a steam valve failure, which limits its speed. Okinawa has a boiler failure. And both of these ships had carried thousands of refugees back. Remember, they're the ones that the refugees landed on. They had taken these refugees to Grandy Island in the middle of Subic Bay. And these are CIA transcripts, which um, were FOIA'd. The Hancock is to get underway from Subic at 18 knots or maybe 23 knots because of that boiler problem it has. And I'm not sure that actually happened. Meanwhile, Midway had carried its refugees all the way to Guam. And Enterprise had been out for nine months. And even a magic ship like the Enterprise, the newest carrier we had, a nuke, after nine months is beat up. And uh, John, do you want to say anything about your experience on, I know they had an escalator there and I thought this is like, come on. We did have an escalator. The, uh, just that the, uh, the first of all, I got to realize that's nine months, but I've never, as soon as you deploy on a carrier and they leave at the site of land, they extend you another month. Right. Yep, even a brand new ship like that. And I was on an old ship that was the Midway class, which was a super carrier at the end of World War II. So now he looks around and the Coral Sea, which has Air Wing 15 embarked. And remember, we were a guard ship along with Enterprise for frequent wind evacuation of Saigon, is heading to Australia. It's 1,700 miles away down by the Straits of Bali, getting ready to go through to uh, Western Australia at 28 knots. And in World War II, this ship could do 33, but I need to talk to you about the Coral Sea. I got sent to it from a destroyer as it was working up in Alameda. And the problem the Coral Sea had, this is built on a battleship hull. It has 12 boilers, 600 pounds steam. It went through Hunter Point Naval Shipyard, and when it got out of a year and a half overhaul, four of the boilers didn't work. That's called CASREP, Casualty Report. So they report it. So we ride this ship on the 7th of December, Pearl Harbor Day, 74. We head under the Golden Gate, and we go down to Pearl, and they put on the PAC fleet inspection team, and they ride us all the way to Subic. When we get to Subic, they relieve the chief engineer and the executive officer. Why? Because the boilers didn't work. And that meant our capacity was reduced. It wasn't their fault. It was the bastards civilian workforce in Hunter Point. So anyway, we had mended ourselves at Subic Bay. Um, Coral Sea has a habit of being a workhorse. It had done eight Vietnam deployments. The longest one was the longest one in history in Vietnam was 11 months. As John said, they get extended. So this was, I figured this up at 28 knots, it would take about 60 hours after the attack to get you there at 15 May, early in the morning. 
And here's the CIA uh, transcript. It says, SYNCPAC tells Coral Sea to proceed at maximum speed to Palawai Island, which is near Kotang Island, and wait at instructions. So I put this together. Lou talked about the Philippines and Thailand. And notice everything they had, 111s, F4s, A7s, Spectre, AC-130, EC-130 Command, OV-10s, CH-53s, H-53s, and even the Navy P-3 at Utapau. And all these were used. They bring down the uh, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, which are on maneuvers in Okinawa. They had another unit that they wanted to send, but the term of enlistment of those Marines was coming up and they said, well, we want to extend them. And there was, a, no, you can't extend them. So they took the second and ninth Marines and shipped them quickly down. They had no idea what was going on. Some people thought it was going to be to guard an embassy or something. Harold E. Holt had one gun and it was out of action because its 24 volt power supply was in up. But they were in the Philippine Seas with Charles B. Wilson, which was a destroyer, a guided missile destroyer, and they Hayaku down here as fast as they can. At Subic, you have the 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, staging them into Thailand also. You have a Navy P-3 and the P-3 from Utapau are the first ones to arrive on the scene. And then you, we saw that Hancock and Okinawa were in port. So our ship had been in Singapore and we were heading down here for the Coral Sea Festival. And the Sink Pack Gaylor Admiral did not want to send the Coral Sea because we had rusty sides and we had, were beat to shit. And uh, I was the assistant first lieutenant, which means paint the ship guy and heads and all this other stuff. I was sent to Singapore to get a paint contract. And we are now driving down here and it's the middle of the night. My roommate, Lieutenant JG, Bill Teggy, US Naval Reserve, is up on the uh, bridge. And he gets the word from the Admiral to turn the entire formation made up of Gridley, uh, a big DLG, Lang and Bossell, and also the oiler, Miss Pelion. They've just gone through Straits of Bali or in this area, and he gives the command Corpin 180, and he gets authenticated, authenticated. You know, we, nobody can believe they're going to go 180 degrees, and we're in dangerous maneuvering area. But that was the order, Corpin 180, turn around, heading 350, full speed ahead, make turns for 28 knots. I found that you can actually find the logs of the ships. And I found out my handwriting was better back then than it is now. <laughs> and what I want to say is at 28, and there's missing logs, very interesting. Between the 12th and the 15th, all our logs are missing. And that's probably because of the Henry Kissinger thing I'm going to get into. So we get up there, our A7s take off, and you'll see what happened. And then we eventually recover the Marines and take them to the Philippines. And as we're heading to the Philippines, a C2 carrier on board delivery lands. And these guys that look like the Beach Boys came out. They had long hair. and good tans and they had these weird, you know, under machine gun over grenade one. And I'm looking at them from the bridge and they were seals. And we'll talk about that. <laughs> Whoops, frozen. I'm frozen. I might have said something bad. <laughs> but I'm just getting warmed up. And, and Lou's gonna tell the real story. You want to start again and we can, yeah, any question, <laughs> any questions while we're having this little interlude? Okay, so a couple things. This is a carrier Coral Sea. It's alongside, that's 120 feet to the oiler and then that's 80 feet to a destroyer. Um, this is Mickey Wisner, who had commanded Coral Sea in 1960 to 61. He's a very salty guy, but uh, Miller Hudson, who went through Officer Cannon School, knows that you're not supposed to have, that's a whatever, 
An admiral's smile, that's exactly right. You're supposed to have it right up to the top. Even ROTC people knew that. So he looked at the casualty reporting board in uh, Pearl Harbor. A guy, as aide, asked Admiral Wisner if he thought Coral Sea would make it because he's got all these boilers and problems. Admiral Wisner told him she's a hard steaming bitch, she will make it. And this, <laughs> he was right even though I went from 28 knots down to 25. And then suddenly we did, in the Navy we call this gun decking, where you paint over everything on the gun decks. You took the CAS reps that had been up there and just removed them. And they, the boiler BTs, is anybody a BT here? They had a way of um, gun decking. The, the burner tubes have little spray nozzles and then the senior chief had one that basically just went straight in, you know, and it could make some power, but then the sides of the boiler started. And that would be 160-pound uh, me. Skinny guy. Skinny. This is literally a battleship bridge, and this guy with the beard, because you could have beards back then, is Fred Bench, and he's a reserve, and I'm getting out of the Navy, but then I get to go to flight school, so I stay in the Navy. And... So we talked about Kissinger finally briefing the congressional leadership. That's Carl Albert, Republican leader from Oklahoma. That's Senator Mike Mansfield, the majority leader smoking his pipe, and Jerry Ford. Who's at the bottom? Is that uh, Dick Cheney there? Boy, it sure it looks like an older guy. Cheney had been miraculously appointed uh, Secretary of Defense at like age 27. There was a thing when uh, Ford came in uh, and it, around Halloween, it was called the Halloween Massacre. And Dick Cheney was a young con former congressman from Wyoming who was chief of staff of the White House. And he miraculously became Secretary of Defense. And Rumsfeld, who's in there someplace, uh, was chief of staff. And then they made Kissinger they, they only kept Kissinger and one other person from the originals. So here is the order at 2045, and I'm not sure if, I think that's Washington time, Kampung Song, Sihanoukville will be hit by Coral Sea aircraft. The assault on Koh Tang by Marines is to begin at sunrise, 0600, 15 May, Cambodian time is actually 1900 uh, May, uh, Eastern Daylight time. And these are uh, transcripts, again, from the CIA. Also, Strategic Air Command, SAC, requests support for B-52 operations against Cambodia. And these are the type of things. This is Thailand, F-111As, A-7Ds. And I'll turn it over to Lou for the Air Force and the rest. <clears throat> Just, this has to do with forces that were there, and again, it's the decision process. Uh, there's an outfit called the Command Advisory Function, which is highly classified, so I can't tell you what all they do, but they do know what's going on around them. So in this case of the Mayaguez, they knew almost immediately that the, the uh, Kimber Rouge had sent a boat out in front of this one. And, uh, and so we were aware of the situation. And the reason I mention this is the first special ops squadron was down at Okinawa, Okinawa at Kadena. They worked extensively with the SEALs out of Subic Bay. They had just two days prior to this had a practice exercise where they dropped the SEALs and the SEALs retook a ship. That was their practice exercise. And when he gets into what was actually took place, you understand that, and, and we'll talk further, but uh, can we go to the next one? Sure. So this is a SEAL jumping out, and, and by the way, this picture came off of the SEAL's website. <laughs> <laughs> next one. And you can see the relative position. They're almost in the same place as the, all the forces that responded came. The difference being is we knew right away. Now, my role, as I told you, I was cats and dogs. Special ops fell under my purview. And in those days, special ops basically were assigned to the command in the area where they were. So these guys 
fell under 5th Air Force, pack half. The special ops that Don will talk about fell under 7th Air Force over in Thailand, and <coughs> nobody talked to anybody. There was no coordination between the special ops outfits. Go ahead. Thank you. And on the Navy side, this is the old, what squadron? 95. 95. And that's the Green Lizards out of Whidbey Island. And that's one of their planes right down there. And then these are the Mighty Shrikes, the A-7s. And this is the Fighting Redcocks. And everybody thinks the Navy's number one priority on aircraft carriers is Tom Cruise and Top Gun. That is bullshit. <laughs> these guys... Exactly. Their combat air patrol, to pr the tip of the spear is these guys who could go all weather, A6s, and then these A7 guys. And for a while, the Navy was run by attack pilots, by the CNO, uh, Chief of Naval Army. This is 51, and this is the famous Sundowners, VF-111, that's shooting down the rising sun in World War II. And they did, they took out uh, Seanookville, everything, and they started putting in air support. This is my boss, Steve Teal. He was the first lieutenant, and they were told, I remember our Marine detachment, we had like 30 or 40 Marines on board and two officers, they all had ropes in the hangar bay, and they were climbing them getting prepared to go take the ship Mayaguez back. And so Steve Teal, I didn't know this, he sent me this, the Coral Sea Marines would form a boarding party to retake it, and as ship's first lieutenant, I would be leading it. So he's in, he's a lieutenant commander, and he goes down to the Combat Information Center, heard pilot requesting permission to fire as his cannons are firing. And the Commodore laughs and said, well, I guess we can give him permission. And they were in contact with the war room, and Henry Kissinger is going, asking, what would be the bomb load on the plane that already fired? So they, they go, why are we telling him this? Because we've already, because the Navy, they were trying to direct the battle. Henry Kissinger. The Commodore said, you declare war, I decide how to fight it. And these are Steve's word, Coral Sea pilots took out Pol Pot's only seaport navy, that's oil, and air force before lunch, and then started bombing Koh Tang. We had no direction from area commander in Thailand. We just did what we thought could be done, like the navy hadn't been fighting in this area for 10 years. And it was one of the first ones in and the last one out. So Teal, at 2200, because he's going at dark, and he's got the motor whale boat, and he's got the marine, some marines, they lower him in. It was probably a Liberty launch, one of the big boats. They get, touch the water, and they're getting ready to unloose the falls, the things that, the ropes and the tackle, and suddenly they're hauled back up because the White House had decided to cancel a mission, and we'll see what they did instead. So, a great deal happened, and the initial assault in Koh Tang were these knives, five CH-53s, three Jolly Green Giants, and eventually, 230 Marines. This is the Dust Devils, the 21st Special Ops Squadron out of uh, Thailand. Lou, any thoughts? Only to say that I've got these guys. Remember the guys from Okinawa that trained with the SEALs, and they were trained for doing this kind of thing. These guys were not trained for all of the shipboard activities uh, and so we had a non-trained outfit, and then when you get into what they really sent down, it was even worse. That's right. So this is what happened. The initial wave in, knife, uh, these are CH-53s. You can see two of them were shot down. Some people were killed. Um, some people were floating around. The forward air controller, First Lieutenant Terry Tonkin uses survival radio. He's floating and he's calling in airstrikes from the Coral Sea and from Air Force planes. Uh, he was rescued by this ship, uh, DDG-7, the USS Wilson. Also, the Knife 23 co-pilot also called in airstrikes. And this 
shows the actual A7s. These, these could be Air Force or it could be Navy. There were F4s, there was F111s, there was a lot going on. And that's a sunk Khmer Rouge uh, swift boat. I, I've got a question. Sure. Go back to the last slide. Um, this Lieutenant uh, Terry Tonkin, right. what was he flying when he got shot down? He was in the back of one of these knives. So he was being carried by the Air Force and he got shot down and some of them swam around. There was actually three shot down and there was five total, but these guys, I guess it was knife 23 because there's the co-pilot calling in airstrikes and this guy was also a FAC. But what was knife 23? What kind of airplane? Uh, that would be a CH-53 Special Ops out of Thailand, Air Force. So they got shot down in the water right? and they evacuated yep. But many of them were killed, and uh, the Marines never leave their dead. You're a Marine, and uh, that you'll see affected some of the decisions later on. This is uh, the battalion commander, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines. This is his citation for the Silver Star. He also got the Legion of Merit. So he was pinned down. He had 26 Marines and three Navy corpsmen, not exactly your best infantry guys, but they were pinned down and he organizes command into assault group and they landed on an east beach and a west beach and uh, he got the Silver Star. And these are pictures of the Marines and this shows the kind of work the company GXO, first lieutenant, assumed command of elements and began directing close air support Silver Star, second lieutenant, he was platoon commander, first lieutenant, first platoon, Navy Cross. And this are some other heroes. This is the 40th ARS, remember the Jolly Green Giants that were involved in everything from uh, airlifting out of uh, Phnom Penh, Saigon, etc. And here's them. And on the 15th, you have two things going on. A group, remember the Marines from the 1st Battalion, 4th Marines out of Subic Bay, their task, they're brought in by Air Force, Jolly Green Giant, who's never landed on uh, Harold E. Holt, which is this long destroyer, and he kind of touches down, and these Marines come out, and then they go alongside, and this is a picture of them taking the vacant Mayaguez. Remember, it's near Kotang Island. Nobody, they thought the crew might be on there. They thought it might be booby trapped. And then eventually this is a Thai uh, trawler brings the crew back to the Henry B. Wilson, the DDG, after this is all over. Diplomatic stuff worked and everybody got back. This guy did amazing things. He's Air Force Academy. Uh, Lieutenant Backlund. He's the one that sort of landed on the back of that destroyer. He'd never done that before. Superb airmanship, Harold E. Holt. And then after he did that, he went over to Koh Tang Island and evacuated people and got back to our ship, Coral Sea. And this is a Jolly Green Giant. That's a view from the back. That's the Air Force Cross. And unfortunately, he was in A-10 training and died in 1979. This is uh, Tech Sergeant Wayne Fisk. He's a PJ, uh, the guy uh, who went out of the helicopter and actually went into the tree line to make sure they'd gotten everybody. He found two and they all went back to the helicopter and then they were told by somebody that everybody had been evacuated but they found out, and this we're going to talk about, three were left. And these guys were part of a machine gun squad. And as they shrank the perimeter, there was bad communication, so they were still holding the perimeter and everybody left. Fifteen had been killed, eventually eighteen, and over fifty were wounded. This was a, a mess. This is a is cricket EC-130 controlling everything. 
And so the total was 41 because an Air Force helicopter had a main rotor failure with this 56 security forces MPs basically, and they all went down in Thailand, 23. These are the names of that valiant machine gun squad led by Lance Corporal Hargrove, Private First Class Hall, Private Denny Marshall, and they continued to fight until they were surrounded and they were executed. And this was not known, and by the way, the White House covered up the Air Force loss of that helicopter of 23 because they didn't want to show too many. Now, blood pressure pills, okay. So there's Rumsfeld, the Chief of Staff, Brent Scowcroft, there's Ford, and there's Henry Kissinger after they got the news that they got the ship back and they're celebrating. Meanwhile, back on the Coral Sea, we're holding a memorial service for the people that have been killed. There is a group called Kotang Beach Club, which is the Marines that were there. You can find it on the internet and you can see. So I mentioned I, I had the bridge and I'm up there and, you know, CODs, Carrier Onboarder Delivery C2 comes in from Subic. They come in all the time. The ramp goes down. These SEAL guys come out. All of a sudden, we get the word Corpin 180, turn the ship 180 degrees, race back to Koh Tang Island, because we're now heading to Subic with the Marines. So meanwhile, what's going on, they're proposing a rescue operation using Marine volunteers who are now on Coral Sea. There's only three serviceable Air Force helicopters. My boss told me they pushed a couple of them over, sea, over the side, which the Air Force did not appreciate, because we needed the deck space. And our Commodore, Coogan, met with Colonel Austin, Captain Davis, Gunny Sergeant McNamara, and the new SEAL guy who just came out of that plane with his team about options. And the options were, as we went back, Marines had never lost a dead. They also knew there were three people missing. They, they were looking at everything from using a captain's motor whaleboat on Coral Sea with some Marines on it and flying a white flag and saying, we're not here to fight anymore, we just need our people back. And they, they wanted to find out, first of all, if those three were still there, because they didn't think they were, and they were overruled by the White House from doing that. And then we turned around and went back to Subic Bay. Meanwhile, it turns out that one of the three had a Prick 63 or some kind of survival radio, and he was calling Cricket and these other airborne asking to be evacuated. It's, it's, this is the Marines on Coral Sea. You can see that's a jolly green giant and sailors. And these, they're coming off of Coral Sea. That was May 20th, the only time I ever saw a brass band in the Navy. That's an Army thing. They have a lot of brass bands in the Army, but they had one. Somehow, the, maybe the Navy borrowed the Army brass band for these Marine heroes coming back. And here's what happened. This is the group where all these casualties came from. 18 Marines and Navy, because the two Navy corpsmen died, 23 Air Force. This is, they're the last guys on the wall, 1975. Ford's approval rating rose 11%. We get kicked out of Thailand because we're using it as staging base for military operations and we weren't supposed to. I call this a joint goat rope, bad intel, communications. Kissinger especially ignored the World Powers Act. And this eventually, you know, the, at that time the president went down through the joint staff to each individual service chief, like the Air Force Chief of Staff and the Navy Chief of Naval Operations. Goldwater Nichols changed that so it went JCS. The president could actually talk to combatant commanders like the Pacific Command. Can I interrupt you there? Go ahead. This has nothing to do with this. Uh, but when I was a mission director in, at Utapau for B-52 operations, uh, one night uh, the command post received a message 
from the White House, top secret, eyes only of the wing commander. The wing commander was not on the base. So I went down and opened up and read his mail. Um, long story was, then we then took the first mission into Cambodia, and that was what was in that message. And that's how it came it all came, the way down. Yeah, but it came from the White House. Yep. And Lou, keep going on the decisions and lesson learned. Already? <laughs> well, every, everybody was separate, so you didn't really coordinate. And special ops was special. It was separate. Um, just leaping ahead. I don't know if we got that on there. We do. But just to, to say a couple things, there was a separation of command. There was always the interagency rivalry going on and, and the directions out of D.C. Uh, we sometimes used the wrong equipment. And of course that happened uh, later on also. Uh, he's, he's ahead here because this is not my glass. This is actually the issue in Iran. Um, and, and by the way, the guy who was the commander of the spe first special ops squadron was also the commander of the Air Force folks in Iran, well. which again was not coordinated. So we didn't learn we didn't learn any lessons as we went down this particular line, and that was the big problem. It wasn't unified. Uh, actually, in a, in the Iranian situation, they had each service had its own commander on the ground, which uh, which was kind of bad and. and uh, no picking on the Navy, but the Navy wanted to use their helicopters, which did not have sand screens, and then they hit a sandstorm. They could have used the Army helicopters, which had the sand screens, and they would not have had that problem, but that's the way it was. Um, and they didn't take advantage of what they, this operation on Mayaguez was a recovery. But we knew about it in time to keep the Kemper Rouge from taking that boat. While, while they were still on the boat, had not taken over the boat if we had put the seals there. And as I said before, they had just two days prior had a practice exercise doing this. So all this thing played out. And most of this stuff that we talked about here was two days after the ship was taken. Oh, this was all 75. We didn't create the Special Operations Command until, what, 10 years later, 86? Right here. Right, right, 87. 87. Now the Special Ops Command is, in fact, a unified command. And, of course, they have a four-star, and that's very important in the, in the service. They've got to have at least the same rank as whoever you're dealing with. Um, and each of the services have their organizations. The Air Force has special ops commands now that are co-located with the specific, uh, like SYNCPAC and SYNC York. Uh, but special ops runs special ops. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the Army, Navy, and Air Force do not fight wars. It's the unified command structure that fights wars. And by making a unified out of this, they, remain, they retain control of their forces. So theoretically, if this ever occurs again, <laughs> it will be a coordinated activity run by the military. The headquarters of stock is at McDill? At McDill Air Force Base, yes. Got a question down there, Miller. No, not, not actually a question. I want to go back to the Pueblo uh, that you mentioned earlier, because uh, by the time we uh, recovered the crew and Lloyd Duke, Member uh, that came back who was the commander. My my Miller Hudson's opinion is he should have been court martialed when they got him back into the states. But because it was a communication ship, they had all of the multi-channel encryption on there. They, there there's a incendiary device in it only had to be pulled and thrown overboard, which is what they're supposed to do. And the fact is that those machines were taken back to Moscow. And the way we knew about this was about whenever that was, 18 months later, whenever that crew came back, we got orders to destroy all of our encryption machines. I was at the Naval Communication Station in Puerto Rico by then, and uh, uh, along with cartons and cartons of uh, encryption,
in which were those IBM cards uh, that we used on the event. So whatever happened aboard the Pueblo, they did not take the actions that they needed to take for a ship that was about to be seized. That, that's exactly right. In fact, there were other issues. He shouldn't have, he shouldn't have just sat there and let them do what they were doing either. Right. Right. That's just like giving up before they ever started. And you're right, he should have been court martialed. Thank you, Matt. And these are some of the books that were written in 1975, Four Days in Mayaguez. This is the best one. It's by an Air Force retired Colonel Ralph Wetterhan. He was an F 4 pilot who researched and basically exposed that we had left the three Marines and how they were executed and it's sad. And then this is uh, through Naval Institute proceedings in 2011, the 14 hour war. And that's it. If you have some questions, this was a traumatic time. John. I can't remember if you said something at the beginning. What was the cargo? The, uh... It was stuff that they were taking out of Vietnam as it fell. There was some stuff from the warehouses. It wasn't anything. No. Because it sounds like they, the DC was more interested in getting the ship back than. Yeah, they didn't care about the cargo. It was the people, and they didn't want another Pueblo. Yeah, it, it didn't have anything really important. It just said stuff. containers of stuff. Um, other thoughts? Uh, no, it was Sealand was run by a, an American company under contract to the Department of Defense. But normally we use foreign sailors. Well, there's a lot of foreign sailors, merchant mariners, especially in Asia. You're right. That's correct. It probably did. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, sir. Another thing that kind of relates to this is the Navy P3, which yep. collided with a Chinese jet fighter. Yep. And then the P3 ultimately landed in China and delivered that airplane to them. Yeah, this is embarrassing for me. I went on to. Go ahead, Lou. I. Uh, got to go to flight school and uh, 18 months later I was flying P3s out of Iceland. And on my mission commander board, we were down in Sigonella on a deployment going below the line of death, Gulf of Sidra. We'd go down there by ourselves. This was in 1977, 78 with a Navy electronic plane watching. And so the question to me on my mission commander board Okay, Lieutenant, uh, you're being intercepted by MiG-23s. What are you going to do? You're down in Gulf of Sidra. I said, I'm going to drop down to 50 feet because I don't think they have look down, shoot down capability. And if they, I don't think they can fly as low as I can. And I'm going to put a rooster tail up of uh, spray. I'm going to be at max military, 10, 10 TIT, turbulent temperature, or max military was 1049. And I'm going to get out of there. And that was the correct answer. So when what you said happened, those guys were collecting on Hainan Island, the Chinese, in the Gulf of Tonkin. They got thumped by a bad uh, Chinese jet. They it knocked their uh, ray dome and fouled their engine and they're shaking. And he had um, probably 25 people on board, you know, a lot of intelligence people and linguists. And he elected to go back to the place he was collecting. I was totally fucked up. He should have, I actually measured it out and he could have made Subic in 400 miles. And then I said he could have ditched. So I have a friend named Bill Schneider. Bill Schneider was an undersecretary of state and I used to drink beer with him in Washington. And when this happened, I said, I'm so pissed off and here's what should have happened. So I drink a beer with him. He goes, I hope you don't mind, Don, but I uh, gave your email to Rummy. Donald Rumsfeld, <laughs> Secretary of Defense, because the Navy was trying to make these, this crew out as a hero. And the fact was they, they did some very good things, air control, but then you know that, ship, that plane was shipped back to us, and they didn't destroy everything. Yes? So I, was, uh, I was car group five strike ops officer during that time. Carrier group five. I'll translate as Navy-ish. Yeah. Why did they go back? Just like you just mentioned, 
The answer I got was that Clinton had changed the rules of engagement. Oh. Now, do you, is there any truth? I, I didn't know that, and uh, I wouldn't care about the president when my plane's coming apart. I'm heading I west. I even <laughs> said in my thing that Rumsfeld read, hey, the North Vietnamese are on our side now. You could get to Hanoi. It's this far. It's 90, 60 miles. And it's better to be in their hands than in the red Chinese, who are still real communists that so don't buy Chinese stuff. Thank you. And you had another question. I think the pilot got a DFC for that. He did. And he almost ran for Congress from Nebraska. But I have to say, the P3 guys that would be on that I talked to said that uh, they all thought he made the wrong decision, that yeah. it was bullshit. And, uh, but I came from a different generation too and and then I got to back up and shut up Don because I wasn't there but it seemed to me based on my experience I would never give myself I hate the Chinese I hate them yeah. well, that's, and that's why I was you know when I asked, kept asking the question they, they kind of shut me up yep. saying, well, the rules of engagement, so uh, go to the nearest, go to the nearest yep. yes ma'am you had a question did you have a question oh, I Go ask it. Ask anything. I mean, I'm. It's probably one that everyone else in the room knows. Um, you said 138 AT were lost. What did they see? Aircraft. Okay. Sorry. I thought it was probably for you, but. No. Aircraft carrier, and I thought no. oh, that's not it. <laughs> and that's including Air Force B 52s, fighter planes, and all the Navy attack and fighter planes, and, oh. and helicopters. Oh. Jolly Green Giants were lost during linebacker trying to rescue people in North Vietnam. There, there was an incident that took place. I gave John the article on the, on the thing oh, yeah, great in, in 1983, where they actually made the right decisions in the right time. Uh, there was a Navy P-3 flying into the in, uh, near Russia uh, in the uh, proximity of where that KAL airline had been shot down by the Russians, and the Russians scrambled fighters with the intention of shooting down the P-3. But again, because of that command advisory function, the 5th Air Force commander knew it, and so he launched a flight of F-15s out of Osan, which then flew up, and the uh, Soviets decided the better discretion, the better part of valor, turned around and went home. And, and the P-3 continues. But the P-3 was in international waters. Yep. But interestingly, uh, Washington was not necessarily... Washington was not involved. That's right. Yep. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? We've run over. Appreciate your time today. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I didn't read this ahead of time, but did you, you didn't talk about the people that were, they were rescued people on they the were, island, right? The crew. the crew had been taken by a little boats to the Cambodian mainland, and the intelligence was bad, so they... They attacked, we invaded Koh Tang Island and went into a firestorm. The Marines went in and it turned out the crew wasn't there. Wasn't there. So they were rescued though? They were through diplomatic things right. and there was a chance before Kissinger and Ford pushed the button to launch this invasion of Koh Tang Island that diplomacy was going to happen, but they wanted to prove to the world that we were not missing in action after losing Vietnam. And so they wanted to, sh remember Kissinger wants to make this strong statement and give them a bloody nose because they're a bunch of little um, bad sure. communists. Okay, so was that a good idea? <laughs> no, no, it's, no. It, and, and this is all hindsight, but, but the way it was portrayed on the cover of Newsweek and Time was this, we showed them, and we only lost 18 people, when in fact we lost 41. 50 were, and the, the Marines that we saw in Coral Sea had all been hurt. They, they were mauled. And the other problem was the initial waves of the knife CH-53s, and they were shot down, and people were stuck in them that were dead. And you need to get the bot. And so eventually, they were going to send the SEALs in to do all that and try and look for the three that were missing, and then uh, diplomacy worked and they got the bodies back. And there were uh, our casualty recovery group from 
whatever is J, whatever it is from uh, Hawaii, went over there and, and found the bones and finally found where the three people had died. Was Kissinger involved in the Afghanistan debacle? No. He's still alive. Yeah. 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 He is alive, and he he gives advice. He does have a lot of power and gave advice. And the, but I, uh, yes, sir. And that brings back Vietnam and also Camp. We were unable after 73 to give air support to the South Vietnamese. They had to do their own. Yes, sir. The only time the ANA ever did anything was when one of their own guys was killed. So really? If you go out on patrol, if one of their guys got uh, killed, they go out and death lost in the entire area. Wow. Yep. Wow. Yes, sir. There's a lot of embarrassing yeah. decision making and a lot of incidents. Uh, one that comes to mind, I don't know if you know anything about it, was after Vietnam. Well, after the peace accords were signed uh, in 75, before the POWs came home, uh, that month long space in there, there was a um, airplane that was shot down. I think it was in Cambodia. And uh, Yep. Because it would endanger the peace accords. Do you know about that? Yeah, I heard about that. And I also I just found out about that. heard yeah. about special operators who were still helping in Vietnam after 1973 and in various places. So we had stuff going on and with CIA and everything else. And there were a lot of uh, heroic efforts to try to keep things going. Yes, sir. This is a dwindling source of information and yeah. intelligence in this room. And I'm wondering, is there any effort made to communicate some of these uh, faux pas that have been made from the White House and the upper commands to try to make it better and make it the force that we want it to be? That's a great story. And if you can get a copy of this or give me your email, I'll send it to you. And Mike has it. It has all sorts of links. And there's been a lot of after action reports, Air Force Magazine, all these things. And finally, you're getting CIA stuff, you know, 50 years later about what really happened because they covered up so much of this. And back then, as you remember in 75, we, we only got what Walter Cronkite said and other things. Yes? It's, it's talks like this which educate. And you know, hopefully, unfortunately, yeah. Yep. Gabe is a young West Pointer that uh, hopefully in the future learns from stuff like this yep. and that will help us. And if you go to Wikipedia, Mike had it on the sheet, you can get a really good overview with the references, but this is the book. This Air Force colonel really blew it out of the water in 2001, so that's 22 years ago, but he really researched it, he personally went to Koh Tang Island. He personally worked with the JSOC uh, casualty MIA recovery people. Yes, ma'am. I don't fully understand the role of the Chinese in the Vietnam War. I was young, I was young yeah. back then, but, and I haven't read a lot about it, but what source would you say is the best source to understand so, what? So two things were happening. As the North Vietnamese were getting aid initially from the Soviets who gave them SAM surface to air missiles. But there was a fight going on between the communist world, the Soviets, 
and the Chinese. In fact, in the late 60s, they had hundreds of thousands of troops on the Chinese-Russian Siberia border. They had a shooting war. Shooting war. And it was a different kind of communism. And the Khmer Rouge were aligned with the Chinese real radical Marxist whack jobs. And the North Vietnamese had a split in their leadership. And initially, it was very uh, pro-Soviet. But then the, the Red Chinese faction took a little bit of control. But in fact, there was ethnic fighting between the North Vietnamese and the Cambodians, who are a different ethnic makeup. And that went, they actually went to war after this. And the North Vietnamese just beat the Khmer Rouge back. The Vietnamese uh, don't, do not like the Chinese. They absolutely do not like it. Well, them. didn't they have a war after? Well, they had skirmishes. After the 14th yeah. century. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they had a war after Vietnam. Like do, That's they right. Had to go back to about yep. 1945, and if things had been handled right in 45, we never would have had the Vietnam War. Yeah. So, but the North Vietnamese took over South they did, and then what had happened in 1954 when the French left, it was just called Indochina, and then you had a separation of North and South Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos, which were kind of little kingdoms. And so what happened was we delayed that takeover for probably 15 years by our sacrifice of our blood and treasure in Vietnam. but. I personally think that that was long enough to save Thailand, Singapore, and also my shirt is made in Vietnam now. When I was flying a 747 from Philippines, I had to talk to Ho Chi Minh Control, right. and I went, uh, I'm not going to do that. Control, this is Tower Air, so and so. I just, and to see it from 35,000 feet, all of Vietnam, you can see it out your window. All this happened. This is a uh, and many of you were on the ground there, and it had a lot of effect. So it, it, it made it possible for all Indochina to not go communist? Well, it went communist initially in 75, and eventually the forces of economics, and because the Red Chinese got so nasty, now the North Vietnamese are on our side. Okay. We're using Cameron Bay again. From, it, or not just Chinese, but becoming communist, there was a huge war, fear of domino effect, where the, everything would go communist in Indochina, and possibly it would go to Bang, all the way through Thailand, Burma, to India. They were just fearful in the 50s of that. We were particularly concerned about Thailand, mm -hmm. because we'd actually saved this, the Thais cooperated with the Japanese, and we saved the Thais from being, uh, how, however you want, uh, chastised for that because of our interest in Thailand. And then we continued that interest. And that's and one of the dominoes that we're really worried about. You know, and looking back, you still have the umbrella thing of the experience in the Korean War, which at least gave you the possibility that you could halt you know, the advancement of, of the communists. But of course, that was a peninsula versus one where your whole backside was open to Laos and you know, the communists. So Sometimes the Brits, Brits did the same thing in Malaysia. Malaysia. Yeah. Yeah. The Brits had a long war in Malaysia. And which, Burma. And Burma, yeah. yeah. Keeping the communists out. Yes, sir. I just yeah. want to say one thing. If anybody in here is willing to buy these three books, I would be more than happy to incorporate them into our library. Be good. You can get this one for like um, ten ten dollars, and uh, I got one that's brand new. It was pr printed in two thousand one, and I don't know how this one probably is a real good one because the Naval Institute Press puts that out. But you can find them. Also, another thing, if you said you hated China so much, everybody check your hats. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Actually made in the USA. I'm amazed. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah, so that's the hardest problem. I, I've been against buying anything for probably 30 years. Yeah. But I gave up because.
because you can't buy, even back then, you couldn't buy shoes out of right. China, it seemed like. Well, check them closer nowadays. A lot of them come out of India and Vietnam. Right. Yes, sir, you had a, another point. Well, I was going to say that uh, every time anybody hears the word communist, they go to berserk. Right. They have an automatic reaction that we have to fight these people. Yeah. They think the Vietnamese communists are the same as the Chinese communists. No, they had a war between the two. The major reason that Vietnam went communist, it occurred years ago during the League of Nations, Ho Chi Minh wanted to see Wildrow Wilson for assistance to get, help get the French out of mm -hmm. Vietnam. Woodrow Wilson would not help him. Where is he gonna go and get help? The yep. only place he can get help, in many cases, is to get China, is to get communist help from Russia or, or wherever. And that had a lot to do with why Vietnam went communist to begin with, okay? Now we have to have a war with them because we think that's part of the communist expansion. So the domino theory became a popular item yep. here, whether it's true or not. But, you know, and now, like you were saying, my shirts are made in Vietnam, and most of my clothes are, and we're still buying Chinese stuff. Yep. If you go to Walmart, or Kmart, or not Kmart, they don't exist anymore, but, you know, <laughs> Home Depot, or everything in there is made in China. Yep. We are supporting their armament build yep. by our choices here. Yep. So we're the problem. Uh, if look closer, look at what happened to Cuba. <coughs> Cuba, 90 miles from us, well, those communists, yeah, because we had political differences of opinion with Fidel. And Fidel was just trying to throw up a bad guy that Batista, who 